help women save lives and peacefully end abortion where you live. I can tell you exactly uh, what would happen. Um, The infant would be delivered. Uh, The infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, The infant would be resuscitated if if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. You were serious about that? Be inspired to change hearts and minds by joining over one million volunteers taking part in the global movement happening in your neighborhood. She says, pray that I can get through this abortion. And I said, oh, no, no. So she went ahead and went into the abortion clinic. And she just came out. She told me, I'm not going to get the abortion. We just had a baby shaved. But we had a baby shaved and never to go. Praise the Lord. This is the 40 Days for Life podcast with your host, Sean Carney. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the 40 Days for Life podcast. I am Sean Carney, the president of 40 Days for Life and your host for this podcast, which is dedicated to helping you end abortion where you live. And we have an awesome guest today that is perhaps one of the most influential people in our country at doing just that, ending abortion at the local level. Uh, Their work is more important than ever. We are blessed to have uh, with us. He's going to join us in a couple of minutes. Uh, Jarrell Gotzi, the president uh, of Heartbeat International, the largest network of pregnancy research centers across the country. We have worked with them uh, since the very beginning of 40 Days for Life. We could not do uh, what we do without them because we would have nowhere to send the women. And so their work is so important in a post row world, and we are going to get into it and abortion pill reversal uh, today. Um Before we do that, I have an issue with my co-host, who I will now introduce, uh, Steve Carlin. Steve, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Sean. So you have a wealth of knowledge that's fairly useless, as the podcast listeners have discovered over the years, uh, as do I. And one of that, one of those things, which I, I, it's not useless because I was fascinated by it, is that our upcoming guest is a baseball fanatic like you are. Okay. And so we'll definitely get him on and, and talk a little bit of baseball. Um, so I decided, I woke up this morning, we're recording the podcast. And I was like, you know what? We're going to talk about baseball a lot, but we're also going to get into abortion pill reversal. We've got some legal things we're going to discuss. Uh, we're going to, and I decided not to wear my Astros gear. I've worn it a lot on the podcast. It's not baseball season, and I just decided not to do it. And then you show up, and you're wearing your stupid Brewers hat. Yeah, um, I, but I got my Forty Days for Life shirt on. It's kind of like. <laughs> It's kind of like the mullet business in the front party in the back. I've got, you know, my my shirt is 40 Days for Life. My hat is baseball. When I got the the Google Meets invitation to record this podcast from you, Sean, I think it said abortion pill reversal slash baseball. So I, I covered the bases yeah, that the and email. that is pun intended. OK, well, mine, I actually it's not your fault. It's a psychological problem that I have, which is I can't wear baseball stuff after October before March because the Cowboys are still playing. Now, when this podcast comes out, we don't know if the Cowboys are doing what they should do, which is go and win the Super Bowl, or if they're doing what they have been doing uh, to me and my family and so many people across our country, and that is break our hearts in January. I don't know if that has happened. But as of the recording of this, things are looking up. And so I can only stick to kind of one team during this time period. And uh, I wasn't going to wear cowboy stuff on the baseball podcast, but I think the answer is that you're a better fan than I am. It could also just be a coping mechanism, Sean. Uh, As we record today, my kids are home from school because we're getting uh, seven inches of snow. Yesterday, we got three inches of snow. The day before, we got 10 inches of snow. And so I was telling Jor-El before we... we, uh, as we were preparing to record today, I said there's that great quote from the old time ball player Rogers Hornsby, who said, "You know, people ask me what I do in the winter time. He said, I'll tell them what I do. I stare out the window and I wait for spring and baseball season. And that's where I am right now. So this is a coping mechanism uh, just as much as it is a, 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 a an apparel decision. <laughs> OK, with that said, uh, uh, Jarrell got he's he's been involved in the pro-life movement since 1988. Um, he has had such an impact, became president uh, of Heartbeat International. For those of you who don't know who Heartbeat is, by the way, if you have a local pregnancy center 
in your town, you need to give them money, uh, especially in post row America. That is uh, one of the best things you can do uh, financially with your donations is give money to your local pregnancy center. Uh, I'm a big advocate of that. I've all, I've spoken at hundreds of, of pregnancy resource center fundraising banquets. Um, and that is what we all need to be doing in a post row uh, America, because it's about hearts and minds. We're going to talk about California today. You're not ending abortion in California, uh, but you could close an abortion facility. You can help a mom choose life. One of the best things that you can do is give money to your to your local pregnancy center. And so our guest knows I've said that many times on the podcast. It's not just because he's here. So right now I want to introduce the president of Heartbeat International, Jarrell Gatsi. Welcome. Good to see you. Great to see you again, Sean and and Steve as well. And by the way, thanks for thanks for calling out the pregnancy centers as a great way to support. Like, there's nothing better that's right there in your own community. That's that's really making it happen day in and day out. Appreciate that very much. Well, and what one thing we've talked about, we'll get into more later, is awkwardly and bizarrely, the pregnancy centers came under attack in post row, and that was one of our biggest surprises: the fire bombings. And we'll we'll get into all that later. But uh, it's just I I have. If I go and I speak at a big pregnancy resource dinner, you know, where there's six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand people, I always have one person who comes up and says, Hey, I'm I support abortion. I'm I'm pro-choice. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate what you said. You said some good things, or this, I'm gonna think about this, or I disagree with this, but even though I'm pro-choice, I support this. Like they're actually helping women, you know, they're, they're providing free medical care. And so it's just so odd how all of a sudden um, you guys are the heart of the pro-life movement and they're, they're picking on you. Like you're the, mm -hmm. you're the good guys that everybody likes. You're like mm -hmm. the sweet, the sweet aunt. Um, aside from that, before we get into that, um, one of the random facts about you that is absolutely awesome and was surprising to me because we've just never somehow all these years of knowing you never talked about sports. You've been to every single major league baseball park in the United States of America. Is that true? Everyone that's active, uh, actively being used by a current, current MLB team and a few that aren't active anymore. Yeah, I have I completed that. It took me seven years, uh, but was excited <laughs> to do it. And uh, now I have to keep track because they open them. They open one, a new one up every now and then. Now, the way you said that, did you travel like by foot with a staff? <laughs> like <laughs> that sounds great. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to work on that to, to really cast that picture. Yeah, not quite. You know, part of it is my is like you, Sean. I travel a good bit, and um, I just had to be attentive to when the, what the schedules were. You know, where I was headed. Uh, I had to kind of uh, be a little elastic to get to a couple of places, and then by the last few, I just had to make trips. Uh, direct trips but we made the last one a family trip as well so yeah it just took some coordination amongst having a full-time job and and doing this work and keeping the eye on the prize but also um catching this kind of uh, uh bucket list for me yep that's awesome well, that's a I've good example ask, too go ahead steve i'm at 22 of the 30 so i'm i'm a sim also a nerd like i'm not just a baseball nerd like i like baseball i love baseball but the like the ballparks is what really gets me excited and, and i i have lame conversations that make people want to leave the room um but you're not like that you like these conversations too so i've got to ask the the quintessential question that every ballpark nerd has to ask which one is your favorite of the 30 or i guess of the some of the ones that maybe have closed that you've been to what's what's yeah. number one on the list so i definitely have a favorite but i have to set aside Fenway and Wrigley because those are those are just iconic right and and they're yeah. they're older that they, they're not going to really stack up against some of the things that the newer stadiums can do um but they are they are in their own they have that feel that that sense of history is just like it's oozes out of every aspect of those and kind of where the, how they're positioned in their neighborhoods uh is really amazing so i kind of have to set those aside and once i do that the easy that i have a top five the easy ones are um the 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 you know what surprised me is pnc park in, in pittsburgh mm -hmm. and they've done they did a great job right there on the three rivers they did a phenomenal job of really kind of of capturing the surrounding area and then but my number one favorite is san francisco uh the, wow yeah because the, you know the you have um the what is it the 
McCovey Cove. McCovey Cove, you have the the bay. They they really kind of captured. It's a good experience. It's a beautiful area. It's you know unless you're there really early in the season, it's going to be decent weather, and you just have everything working for them. They've done it really really well. I had the chance yeah. to get there this summer, and it was breathtaking. And also, I had the best sandwich of my life. It was very strange. It was a sandwich. It was crab, tomato, and lemon, and it was spectacular. Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> All right, that's where this is where I need to interject here. Um, and the the West Coast Walk for Life, you used to walk past the stadium years ago, like 09, 2010, 2011. They had to switch the route. Uh, so it goes more through downtown, which is great for the evangelization part of the, the mm -hmm. walk. But scenic wise, I don't know if you were ever out there, but back in the day, you, you walked along the bay and it ended at the Golden Gate Bridge. But you went right by their stadium, um, which is which is really, really cool. So my question is, and I have strong emotional feelings if you don't agree with me, but um, I think Steve will agree with me, but w w who has the best food that is localized? Like, do you go to Denver to the Colorado Rockies and you can get like a bear roasted sandwich you know or like steve mentioned the crab sandwich in san francisco i'd be totally into that but your experience i assume you're eating at all these places i hope you are who has the best food for where you are yeah so i actually i'm going to disappoint you because i don't try the i don't try the food I, i'm not a foodie i have a i'm, I'm not going to try some of the more extravagant stuff like i would look at the lobster thing and go like oh that's interesting but never try it oh. uh, uh so i actually actually my habit is ice cream sean I, oh, okay All i right. started because my kids were going with me so i started to get ice cream and i collected the helmets you know you get them in the helmets and all of that and so that became because i i had i had helmets from everywhere i'd been when i started i had to now do it even when i was by myself and i had to get two and and most of the of the stadiums they wouldn't sell it to me just as a as a helmet most almost but one huh. they would sell it to me and i had to buy the ice cream so here i was minnesota and you know i'm in the msp and and it was a I think in the second week of the season, so it's in early April, and it's freaking cold, and I'm having, to, and the, I mean, there was a pained look on the on the person that I was buying the ice cream, the the helmets from, which had to have ice cream because she realized like no one else is buying ice cream when it's 40 degrees out. But <laughs> so mine was the ice cream, and by the way, Blue Bell, of course, in uh, yes, in uh, Texas Stadium is is going to be the best of that. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yes, I agree. And I wasn't even going to advocate for that, but it is true. Blue Bell ice cream and you have that at Minute Maid. You have it at the Rangers Park. You have it everywhere. Um, who is your team? Is it Cincinnati? No, I'm a, I grew up in Florida. I, w I was around okay. when the when the Marlins came into existence. So, oh, awesome. uh, the, you know, and of course, very excited. 97, 03, when they when they won the World Series both times as wild cards right so those are so my team is the marlins so it's which has been um a terrible burden to bear over the last number of years but we got some momentum now so. yeah well back in the day that was that was <laughs> awesome uh well i'll i'll do a shout out i think minute made in houston has the best food they built the new rangers stadium and they didn't do like a texas thing so it's just like ballpark food you'd get anywhere but in houston you can get Killen's Barbecue, which is the best barbecue in Houston. It's in center field, for those of you. You can get, like, ribs. You can get brisket nachos. It's unbelievable. Then we also have Tacare Hernandez, which is uh. the real deal Mexican food. And I took Mr. Carlin, and he's, like, eating tacos, saying, I think this is one of the best meals I've ever had, and I'm at a baseball game. <laughs> um, so... Uh, we we go every year with all the kids and my brother-in-law, he has seven kids and it's just this massive operation. And we go on uh, dollar hot dog night, obviously. And uh, we set the record for this one hot dog stand in center in uh, behind uh, home plate. We're sitting like on the fourth deck. Right. And we ordered 48 hot dogs. And the guy's like, are you serious? We're like, yes. <laughs> and he's like, like, that's a record for our hot dog stand because I guess they compete. And I was like, good. I'm glad we could help. But I really actually am ordering 48 hot dogs. Um, so then we had a priest with us who's a big sports fan and he came with us. And so we're distributing all these hot dogs. And he's like, oh, yeah, thanks. I'll take a hot dog. I was like, what are you kidding? I'm going to get us brisket nachos. <laughs> we're not eating the dollar hot dogs. And so uh, <laughs> but the nachos and I'll close with this are served in a big plastic helmet that you keep okay That's so it. anyways 
No calories, by the way. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so a couple of weeks ago, and I know we have it on the on the on in on the page, the web page. If you want to go back and listen to our abortion abortion pill reversal lawsuit, please do that. We are going to reference that uh, a lot this podcast uh, as a as a quick summary. Uh, the AG, who's crazy in California, created a law where you cannot. Uh, support abortion pill reversal. You can't do abortion pill reversal. You can't whisper that you think abortion pill reversal is good, not only in California, but across the entire country. So we break the legal part of that down in that podcast with our general counsel, Matt Britton. Um, today, we're going to do more of a, of a generic conversation um, about this. And my first question, you know, Jarrell, is, is, I'll, I guess I'll act like I'd, I've never heard of abortion pill reversal. I'm just a fan of it. Um, and we know Dr. Delgado, the 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 wonderful genius who created this, who's a saint. Um, but let's just say he's a nut and he's duped us. Um, from all of the pregnancy resource centers that that Heartbeat has, does is the AG in California right? Does does abortion pill reversal is this witchcraft? that the, all these stupid religious pro-lifers have fallen for and and we're in the wrong. Does does it actually work or we just really want it to work? No, actually, uh, as you know, you well know, it actually works and it works pretty effectively depending upon how early we can get to her how or she gets to us, how early we can get the progesterone prescribed. Uh, really what we're doing is we're just leveraging what the woman's body produces to sustain a pregnancy. The mifepristone, which is the first pill in the in the two pill process of abortion pill, is really designed to starve uh, the baby of progesterone. So if we can get to the baby quick enough, and uh, as we would say, you know, we flood the zone with progesterone, right? Where it's uh, we're just giving her what her body already naturally naturally produces. Now, what the specter of of the the you know, AG and others are trying to uh, suggest is that, you know, a abortion pill reversal is the exotic drug that was cooked up in a lab that doesn't exist anywhere in nature except through manufacturing. That is actually true of the abortion pill mifepristone, right? But, but for abortion pill reversal, it's progesterone. It's just, we have t-shirts that say it's just progesterone. <laughs> I didn't know that. We got to get some of those t-shirts. You hear no, they'll say, well, it doesn't work. It's false advertising. And then then if that doesn't work, you know, when you can show that it's it's that it's works and that it's effective, particularly if the woman comes too early, like, well, it's 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 dangerous. It's unproven. Um, is that true? Any complications, side effects like what what are they talking about when they when when these abortion supporters and advocates, particularly in prosecutors offices? Uh, start claiming that it's dangerous. Well, I don't really know what they're talking about because that you know they first they say that there's no science and then they say then they somehow make make the point that it's very dangerous. There's been no science uh, that suggests it's dangerous. All the science that we've seen, every every uh, study that we've seen shows that it works and works effectively. It, you know, it's not hundred uh, percent every time. It actually works. Um, uh, as we, we've seen a, a rate of about two thirds of the time it works on those if we get to them early enough, like that's key that they that we can get at it quick. Uh, but it works quite well. In fact, their own study, they have, a you know, the Mitch Crichton, the an abortion doctor has a study. And this is what was used a couple of years ago to create the specter of danger. Um, we know that that particular study was uh, intended for 40 women. Uh, when we saw the original IRB and all of that kind of floating around, they actually recruited, I think, 10 women two ultimately, um, or I'm sorry, 12 women, two, two ultimately dropped out for 10. They had three women present, uh, go through the process, they had three women, they had two trials, five and five, uh, placebo and then progesterone. They had three women present because they were bleeding uh, uh, abnormally. Um, of the three women, one was, only one was in the progesterone of progesterone five. The other two were in the placebo five, which tells us that that's not progesterone that is the bad actor. It's the mifepristone, which by the way, on the FDA black, black label warning is, is the very thing that says may cause hemorrhaging, right? That's it. That's partly that's its intent. So 
what happened, what we saw happen was in the Crichton study, or Crichton study, they basically, it, they stopped it. It went dark. We knew it, that, that it wasn't, something was going on because there was every, it was like radio silence. And then suddenly about two months later, boom, single day, the headlines go around the, around the world, including our, our folks in UK picked it up and moved it quickly. And the headline was, uh, uh, abortion pill reversal study ends due to safety for women. And that was the PR perspective that they actually picked up and pushed around the world, which is what gets echoed by the AG and by others uh, are, are, are doing. They're doing that intentionally obscuring the, the information in Krinan's own study. Because actually, if you look deeper, and our entire medical advisory team looked very quickly and, and deeply into the actual research, their research showed four of the five women on the progesterone side were still pregnant at, at you know at, at that point that we would count as a success so their own study that they lean into suggesting it's dangerous or bad actually showed an 80 percent effectiveness rate now that's a very small study and we understand that but that still that still puts the lie to what they're saying about this being dangerous it it, it is so insane because it, it's so basic this is one of the best analogies I, I can think of is if you have something in your system, whether you took it or, or, or it's just there like a kidney stone, and you don't want it, many times <clears throat> water is the answer. Okay, you can need to flush this out, it can, whether it's like some kind of poison or a kidney stone. Kidney stones, you have to – you got to drink tons of water, drink tons of like lemon juice, lime juice. <clears throat> All that stuff is good at flushing out kidney stones. My wife's side of the family is they have like a million kidney stones. No one comes out and says water is dangerous. Um, I mean, this is why y'all's t-shirts are so brilliant. We're, <clears throat> we're talking about something that is natural that cannot hurt you at all. And yet it, it, it is it is it is once again politics or, or an agenda invading nature and medicine and and it's a total false premise um i want to go back to this california law <clears throat> and i know you're in the middle of this lawsuit um so feel free to say i can't talk about this or i can talk about it but the way the law reads which is it's very poorly written we talked about that on the previous podcast um the ag is applying this law not only in california that abortion pill reversal is bad. You can't support it. You can't do it. But they're trying to apply California law to the entire country. How in the world could any state? I mean, this is like Texas saying you in Washington, you will allow uh, crack cocaine. We legalized it here. And if you speak out against crack cocaine, uh, you're violating Texas law and we'll have you arrested. It's absolutely nuts. Yeah, in fact, it, you think about it, it, to me, these are echoes of uh, the era of slavery, right? The, thing, the, the era where you had states creating laws like, okay, not only, not only is it okay to have slaves in my state, but by the way, if one of, one of the slaves in my state wanders into your state, I can go and, and, and do whatever I need to do. I can violate the, the sovereignty of your state by going in and, and, and bringing that slave back. I mean, this is the, the there's, so many, there's so many eerie um, uh, parallels to what this whole post-row dynamic, I know you guys have been all over it and discussing it at length, but I, I'm just been shocked at how similar it is to the things that happen in the you think in the 1820s and i'm not particularly studied about that but i i you just i, I go back and realize like wow these are the same things that were going on with the other great uh, uh moral imperative of our nation's history which was slavery right so now we have abortion where some of the same things are happening dred scott where you have you know the uh the black people being declared three fifths persons, right? You you have these these where where they're not where they're being able to be sold as property. Like you have the same thing happen in the in this dynamic. And so when it comes to the state of California, thinking that they can push the, their perspective, I, I perhaps maybe Governor Newsom and his um, his lackeys, including a, you know AG Bonta, have really uh, seen themselves as sovereign over all of the country. It's interesting yes. to me the timing here because 
abortion pill reversal was pioneered by Dr. Delgado, who's from California. Like this has been going on for a significant amount of time. They and should be proud it, of it. They, they should, should be, be proud, proud of it. And if the time to come after it, you would think if they're going to go after it, it'd be at the beginning when it's unproven. But now you have years and a track record of success showing A, that this works and B, that it's safe. Um, why in the world, after this going on for years, do they suddenly decide now they're going to they're going to go after it and sue you for false advertising and and unfair business practices? Well, it feels like that's the uh, that, frankly, uh, just this is my opinion. I don't have any evidence, direct evidence of this other than uh what we see it feels like there was some meeting somewhere uh by big abortion and said hey guys you know you, you're now the abortion states you need to do these next steps in order to continue to advance the issue of abortion we saw that in new york we've seen that in illinois we certainly have seen it in california and it kind of connects sean to what you were saying earlier about attacking pregnancy centers so that's why you see all these laws being written about so-called deceptive advertising by the way every state in the nation has a deceptive advertising law on its books they didn't need to write a new one except they're trying to create the specter of a pregnancy centers doing something wrong they're going after abortion pill reversal and I, I, for the life of me, could not understand this until you just start to realize, like, no, they, they cannot abide the fact that their ideology and their main profit pro product, abortion, um, that anyone would would want to reverse that, that, that they, they, they can't go with that messaging. It's one of the same reasons why they attacked the concept of post-abortion stress syndrome right you know a, a, compl a trauma that comes from abortion they cannot they cannot have anything go against that so that's why they're coming out and they have the political muscle and they kind of have the imprimatur so to speak of the you know the, the supposedly terrible thing our supreme court did in writing a wrong of a of roe now they they feel like they have to protect abortion at all costs we they, they left to themselves and without being checked uh we really are headed to be the united states of abortion it's yeah it's <clears throat> their sacrament and you can't say anything bad about the sacrament you can't question um the sacrament and that that is what is so odd. But here's just on a practical level, because <clears throat> we only do this with abortion. So if you here's here's the way this is going to play out and, and is playing out and will play out in the future. You have a woman and she says, I want an abortion. She goes in. She takes the abortion pills. She goes home. She changes her mind, as people do on a lot of things, particularly medical decisions. She changes her mind. She goes to Dr. Delgado. He treats her with abortion pill reversal. She has little Sally. Little Sally's born. The AG says this doesn't work. So she goes to testify. <clears throat> and she says, hey, I took uh, the abortion pills. And then I went to Dr. Delgado. And then he saved my baby. Here's little Sally. She's four. And the AG or the judge or whoever is going to look at her and say, you're lying. So it is it is like everything with abortion, as we sit here as three men, everything with abortion is so anti-woman. <laughs> it is they are they are going to start calling thousands of women liars. And and it's it's like a guy losing a hundred pounds and he goes before the court and he says, I lost a hundred pounds. Well, how did you do it? I exercised and I cut carbs. Uh, no, you didn't. You're lying. No, no, no. Here's the photo of me six months ago. I'm holding the newspaper and I, I had a hundred pounds on me and now I don't. You're lying. So they're just going to get to the point where it's, and that is what that's that's a different tragedy in America. It's the witch hunts. Mm. It's Salem of you're not telling the truth because it doesn't fit the narrative because doggone it, there is nothing wrong with abortion. And and that's what you're referencing. And that's that's what's so dangerous is you start accusing your own citizens of, um, you know, uh, uh, of just lying about something that's that's f factual and that you can prove well it's california this is not new for california right they tried to do this uh what is it 
seven years ago, eight years ago, where they tried to have, they, they not didn't try, they passed the law that, that forced government speech upon uh, pro-life pregnancy centers in the messaging that they had to give the clients. Say that, you know, Governor Newsom and, the, and California have been meddling with this for, uh, you know, for a long time. The, they just are intent upon doing this, upon projecting their narrative on the populace, which is exactly what you're saying. But they're doing that by dis- trying to discredit those that are trying to do something about it. You know, even something you mentioned earlier, it's like, you know what, you, you mentioned having someone come up to you after anytime you speak and, you know, in a crowd, you have someone who says, hey, you know, I, I still believe that a woman should be able to uh, make that choice. But I agree with what you're doing. Anyone with any intellectual honesty should believe that about pregnancy centers like the pregnancy centers are not the activists on the on the on the on the hill trying to take away uh, the right to abortion they're not the ones doing that they're trying to help women not need an abortion they're trying to simply say we can help you do that and particularly an abortion pill reversal this is what's so heinous about this is that they these women have have had nearly if not instantaneous have had almost instantaneous regret about having just swallowed that pill. And frankly, Sean, it feels like when they say, no, you can't tell her about it. You can't let her know about it. You can't have anything, anything to do with it. You can't, you cannot, they're saying you cannot help her at all. And that feels metaphorically as if she, as if the state is holding her on the table and forcing that abortion because they're denying her key information to be able to make a different choice to actually withdraw her consent from an abortion she no longer wants and the state says no you can't do that now and i don't you know I, what difference does it make to the state if it isn't ideological ideological and political because they've already got their you know the Planned Parenthood, whoever, already has their money. They've already received, it's already a statistic somewhere on that uh, clipboard or in that medical file. So what do, what would they care if it's not political and it's not narrative-minded and it's not ideological? Uh, because, frankly, and, and we've been blessed to, to know that there's uh, almost 5,000 babies that mm. you know we we know of, and and we're not the only ones counting them. We just have the best count, uh, but we know that there's five thousand women that mm-hmm. have been helped with this process and lives that have been saved. The other side of the coin there is why would they be doing this if it wasn't political? Why would you be doing this? Why would pro life pregnancy centers be doing this if it didn't work? There's no incentive uh, to push something that doesn't succeed. That's right. We we don't you know we don't. We don't charge for this service. In fact, most, you know, uh, nearly every doctor that's involved is doing this as a, as a um, uh, volunteer. Now, you know, they can, they can then later have client visits and maybe that's the doctor that helps them birth that child. But when it comes to APR, I know of doctors that have actually driven to the pharmacist and paid for paid for the prescription that she, so that she could have that progesterone as quickly as possible. So like, like this is a, this is a, a, a work that is done out of charity. It's done out of um, out of opportunity to serve and to bless, and we want to continue to do that. And the government should have should not be interfering with her choice to withdraw her consent from the abortion she no longer wants. You know why they're doing it is because it's effective. Pregnancy resource centers save lives, and we can't have that in a post row California. And that is why that's why I I, I want people to financially support y'all um, because it's effective. It's effective. Pregnancy resource centers are effective. Forty days for life campaigns are effective, and so they're creating laws to get rid of us because they can't convince women not to come to us. I mean, if they were trying to change hearts and minds, they try to get them away from the sidewalks. Don't talk to those crazy people, and they do that all day long. It just doesn't work. And and so they can't change the hearts and minds of the women approaching us. So they're going to try to change the law. And and I think it's a it's a huge pat on the back for for heartbeat. It's it's certainly interesting to be served. I, actually, we were in a staff meeting. Uh, we have staff meetings uh, once a, once a month, and in a staff meeting, and then suddenly before the end of our staff meetings, uh, one of our team, teammates uh, sent me a, a uh, email that 
a reporter said this to us, hey, in about 15 minutes, you're going to be sued by this, by the attorney general of now, how does that reporter know that, right? If this is not, oh, yeah. if this hasn't been leaked and this hasn't been a possibility now. So it's a bit of an adventure to suddenly realize that you've been stu- you know, sued by, by a state and whatnot. But here's what's what, here's where we know God's involved in this, right? So, uh, the AG's office has a com- as a press conference announces all of this. You know, we we are, of course ca- running to catch up. We had no advanced knowledge, no idea what's going. We actually didn't get served until like a week or a half later. Um, so we we didn't wow. know the language of it at all. We're running to catch up with this. He has his pre- press conference, but here's what happens. This is where it's like God is in this. I don't know how, but God is in this. But that weekend, the number of women who reached out to the abortion pill rescue network hotline looking for help went up by three times, three times the number uh, that weekend because of that, uh, that information going out. Of course, lots of folks picked it up and moved it around and it just became something that, so in, in some senses, we're like, hey, could, will you guys schedule another press conference and talk about this more? Because it helps us connect with the women who are regretting that abortion choice and looking for an alternative. I know when Dr. Delgado pioneered this and we saw some of the headlines and the pro-life news sources, I thought, well, this is great. I'm glad some women will be able to take advantage of this. But it was I was a little bit skeptical thinking, how many women are going to go drop four five hundred dollars on an abortion pill? And then, uh, you know, 10 minutes or 20 minutes later, decide, you know, what? I changed my mind. I'm out of this. I didn't think anyone would take advantage of it. Can you tell us a little bit about how that process works like what what leads a woman to go through make the abortion appointment go get the abortion pill take that first pill and then suddenly have an about face you talked about how critical it is to to for these women to be able to get to and to to take that reversal process early on as soon as possible after that abortion pill is taken how do you see such a, a rapid about face and how does it happen so many times well, I, they're, they're, and this has been a developing thing because, uh, you know, as you you guys know this, uh, Google has censored advertising for APR. The numbers should be much higher than they are. But we, when we present, when these women present to us, we're learning a great deal and still looking to learn more. But what we fi- are finding is that she was not this is one of the lies of the abortion industry. Like they, they pretend that women exercise the right to abortion with some great um, enthusiasm and excitement. Yes, I'm here for my abortion. Like that is the farthest thing from the truth. And most women, now here's a stat you might guys might know. Um, it's, it's, it's dated. It goes, it's probably about four or five years old, but it, but it basically nine out of every 10 pregnant women that walk into a Planned Parenthood Will, will leave without their baby. And conversely, uh, I think it's closer to eight. Eight out of every 10 women that walk into a pregnancy center will keep their baby. Hmm. Now, I know in the pregnancy center world, because I know that world really well. Now, not all of those women were totally the in, intent that come into a pregnancy center were totally intent upon having an abortion, were able to, you know, to, to help them understand you don't really need abortion. And so that's why that success rate is great. But I also then believe that's true of the women that are those nine women that walked into the, the Planned Parenthood or any abortion clinic and, and have, have chosen abortion, they, they didn't all do it because they were presenting to do their right. They, they did it because they were conflicted. They did it because they were pressured or coerced. We learned just uh, through a, a study last year that they say 62% of the women uh, say that they were coerced into that abortion decision. So, Sean I, or, or Steve, I think that's what is really driving that that dynamic is she's taking that first pill under duress and the and by the way the abortion industry doesn't care anything about that scenario they're not doing doing the research on that they're not they don't even want to know that they don't want to give her any other chances so when she takes that pill it's something is in her has been in conflict and suddenly she is now um she's taken that step and now she's desperate for for a different answer now i I also believe frankly that the holy spirit is involved in that as well because that's what i what i hear when when she calls literally from the from the parking lot of the abortion provider and and she and we've been told this numerous times right i went back in and said i don't want to go through this is there anything you can do and they tell they lie to her they lie to her whether they lie because it's they, they have they have 
uh, they know about about abortion pill reversal and refuse to tell her the truth, or they have been given false information. Either way, they lie to her and they tell her there's nothing you can do. You have to go through with this, and that is false. And so, from the parking lot, they they have found us at Abortion Pill Rescue Network. Our team at Option Line answers that that first phone call, and they help her. And then we connect her with one of our nurses, and then they're off and running, try to get the progesterone to her as soon as possible. And I believe that that is both that that moral conflict within her that it's not something she really wanted and she just wanted a different way and unfortunately we we somehow we didn't get to reach her in advance again because google plays games hiding centers from the maps and doing and all this other kind you know creating the specter as you mentioned of the narrative against pregnancy centers all that stuff's out there for whatever reason we didn't get her but the but the holy spirit is still speaking to her and that's why it's so important to be on the sidewalks near there to be close with that information and to be available for her so that she can make that choice to change her mind and have one last chance to choose life well, and legally, there's some problems here, and I hope y'all are doing this or it, or, it, or it'll come up at some point. Um, number one precedent, it's not 2010. So they didn't sue you in 2018. They'd, this has been going on a long time, and the AG, the government in California, has known about it. And so, you know, you can't have somebody, um, you know, selling something or promoting something that's harmful for 15 years and then say, oh, by the way, that's illegal. Um, so that there's the precedent issue, which I think will, will really help y'all's case. There's also something that hopefully comes out in discovery. Plan Parenthood employees in California have referred hundreds of women to pregnancy centers. Hmm. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And I bet you in that pool, you have had workers refer women for abortion pill reversal and those workers need to be on the stand because that happens all the time these are workers that probably haven't had a conversion but many of the former workers will say i was full-blown pro-abortion all in and i would refer women to pregnancy centers all the time or i'd refer them to abortion pill reversal they really didn't want it we couldn't help them we do the abortions if you do if, you know if you want to go try this go for it and they refer for it. So if it's so ineffective, how come the abortion industry refers for it? How come I'm sure there's somewhere in California an abortion doctor who has referred a woman to a pregnancy research center? Um, this goes in the category of they're not all bad completely, right? There are some good natured people that see who work in the abortion industry that are like, this woman really regrets this, or this woman, we can't help her. We're going to refer to a pregnancy center. So trying to kill the credibility of pregnancy centers is very difficult to do because as I referenced, you know, the people who are pro-choice and who still financially support them, you have people who work in the abortion industry who appreciate pregnancy centers. They hate us. And that you and I have talked about that before. That's that's one of the gifts, I hope, for 40 Days for Life is we take the arrows. We're the people out on the street. We're the people that everybody can drive by and say, no, you're the lunatics. You're not helping anybody. Go get a life. You're horrible. And that historically in our movement has d distracted people, to use that word, from attacking pregnancy resource centers. The difference here is that y'all are thank God, doing abortion pill reversal. So they're attacking you directly and they're going to attack us for promoting it and supporting it. Um, but I, I just think, and the listeners and the viewers need to know, historically, abortion workers and even Planned Parenthood Inc., has not really gone after pregnancy centers. In fact, they've kind of supported them in passing. This this whole pregnancy centers are the devil is a recent phenomenon. Th this is this is not something that aligns with history. And they're doing it at a time when pregnancy resource centers offer the most free stuff at the most professional level they've ever done in the history of pregnancy resource centers, which, by the way, were invented by Heartbeat uh, in, in Ohio. Um, so it, it's just it's it's very, very ironic. And um I want to ask you on that on that note, um, you know, a lot of our volunteers listen to a, a lot of our volunteers obviously are per volunteering also for for pregnancy centers and supporting them. Um, 
Can you give them a word of encouragement of just what is the impact? Because we hear from directors all the time, the numbers go up when when we're out there. Um, kind of like keep 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 going. Um, but what does what does that look like uh, when you have a forty days for life, and then you have which we have a lot now, a heartbeat pregnancy center pretty close by. Um, do, do, does it impact the numbers? Because we hear that it does. Absolutely. Uh, one, you know, I, I had the privilege of uh, being on the bus tour that you guys did a few years back, and was, we were just talking before starting how, how actually that was many years ago, right? So, of course, everything feels like a long ago when it was before COVID, right? But right. They, <laughs> one of the one of the most precious moments that I had in that bus tour, other than hanging out with you guys and um, you know getting to just uh, uh, just have fun when kind of in between our stops, was pulling up in that in that vehicle. And 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 seeing the the great crowd, the forty you know forty days crowd outside on the sidewalk, but for me it was it was several of them were holding a sign, and that sign said, um, you know, a pregnant, scared, one eight hundred seven one two help. And I, I I thought for that moment I said I said that person you know that 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 wonderful person is out on the sidewalk standing as a witness for life there doesn't know who actually answers that phone call when when that woman calls, but I do. And we know that that there's a that it's effective. We know that there are plenty of many women who will read that number, jot it down. It's easy to remember. And because of that witness of standing out, not just the the obviously the opportunity to interact with her to pray for her, but we know that that those calls happen and lives are saved because of it. Uh, we are grateful for the work that the Forty Days team does. Uh, we can we can see. Um, we can see that bump every spring, every fall when 40 days is out there. Well, I know it's a great joy for us. One of the favorite things that I get to experience is the moms who choose life thanks to Heartbeat, thanks to other pregnancy centers, thanks to abortion pill reversal, and they stay in touch with us. And we get to kind of track their journey a little bit. It happens, I think, every campaign where I get an email from one of our leaders that says something to the effect of, hey, we just had a mom who's going to try to reverse her abortion. And then I stay in touch. And then, yeah, she had an ultrasound today. The baby's doing well. Three days later, another ultrasound. Baby's doing well. And you just track it through the pregnancy. Now we're having the baby shower for her. She's she's being induced next week. She had the baby. It's just such a joy because I know in any given moment when you're out there praying, any given phone call that you get at a heartbeat center, um, you know, there's there's a lot that hangs in the balance. But when you get to, to see how these stories play out uh, over time, over nine months and beyond. It is uh, such a gift to, to see these moms on that journey embrace the life that they were about to lose when they made that appointment at Planned Parenthood. Yeah. In fact, and you know, you, it, it's been a privilege, even as a center director, which I had the privilege of being before coming to Heartbeat. You know, there were many times where someone even walked in a year and a half later. I, I you know, I remember uh, a, a young lady uh, wheeled in a um, a stroller, and inside is like a 18 month old little tow headed kid with the hair kind of flying everywhere. You know, kind of the. And she she looked at me and she said, "You know, when I left here, I was headed for an abortion." And so we had heard nothing from her for two years. And here was the result of that. So that's one of those things that always keep in the back of my mind that even when they don't reach out, even when they don't give us that kind of, you know, wonderful trajectory that she's on, they're they're on it and we just don't know. And that's why I think, I, and I, I say this often, like this side of heaven, we don't, we will never know the full impact of what we do and, and whose lives we've helped change. Uh, but I, but St um, Steve, I've had the privilege of meeting 30 year olds that are, uh, are alive because of the work of the pregnancy center movement, you know, of course, back in those days. And so what we don't always understand is that, that, you know, that, yes, we love, we love rescuing babies and we love seeing babies saved. By the way, we don't rescue a single one. We empower the mom to do that, right? It's, it's that mom that makes that courageous uh, decision. And it's because she sees people of courage saying, yes, we can, we can help. We can make this happen. We can help you do this. So you know that that's one of the. It's not just lifetimes. It's also it's also lives. It's not it's not just lives. It's lifetimes and also a lineage. I, it's one of my favorite things of being blessed to be able to be in the pro life movement, work in the pro life movement. Is is what you said, which is we don't get to see the results a lot most of the time and 
we're not entitled to those results. Mm. We we are called to be faithful, not successful, as Mother Teresa said. And we say this every year at our at our leader symposium or when we do trainings is that you don't know your impact and you frankly need to be detached from your impact and you need to do A, B, and C. And if you do uh, details, the big picture will will take care of itself, which is a, a Nick Saban uh, philosophy. We just lost him. Um, but it, it's so true and it applies to everything. And, and not all industries or corporations are obviously like that. There's a very tangible bottom line, but, but we don't get that. I mean, Abby Johnson's told us many times that the no-show rate for an abortion appointment goes as high as 75% when you're out there praying. Well, we're never going to know that. I mean, that means our numbers are just super, super conservative, which is fine. We only report the babies that we know, you know, that we've heard about or we've met. Um, but it happens all the time. People bring a stroller out and say, hey, you know, I drove past here two years ago and y'all were out here and I just wanted to share my little girl with you. if She's one, you know, and it's just awesome. Um, and I, I think that's so, so important that it definitely applies to the to the pregnancy center um before oh, we close let me, out let go me ahead, say, go ahead. so there's a someone said this actually peggy uh hartshorn is president before me is our board chair you know she said the number one gift that we give actually give that woman is belief we believe in her and so when you're standing out on the on the on the sidewalk or in the center that's exactly what you're doing you're believing she can do this now I, of course i you know for those of us that are are, are christians and coming from that that biblical worldview, we know it's because God believes in her. God believes that she can do this. And yeah, we can give her a lot of other things, but the first that gift that we give, and frankly, probably the most important gift we give is the gift of belief. Because many women, what, what's the problem is they've lost sight of what they can do or how they can get through this. And we bring them back because we say we believe in you. And, and they, they can take that. And sometimes all it takes, as we've described, is that one moment where she sees someone believes in me. Someone believes I can do this. And then they go make it happen because women are amazing. You know, women are amazing in what they can accomplish and how they they can nurture and protect and and, and grow a, not just a, a life but a family. And so they just need that moment of belief. And then, yeah, they may need some other things, and that's where we can help them do that. And that's the partnership that we uh, are blessed to have with you guys. Yeah, it's it's uh, we have a sign that we started distributing a couple of years ago, and it says, "You don't have to do this today." Uh, we'll put the sign on the screen and that sign has just saved so many people because like all of us, we, we're all sinners and we're all, or we're all make decisions out of pressure, not thinking clearly. We've all done this and you just step back and you're like, I just thought that was it. I thought I had to do that. And, and I remember we had a board member years ago. Um, uh, I was, I don't even think I was 30 yet. And I was talking about something and he said, you don't have to do anything, you know, when, when making a decision. And I, I think it's, you know, as long as it's not immoral or whatever, but it, it that abortion, it's just this must. And this is what they're doing by, by making it a sacrament, that this is good. This is your only option. This will solve your problems. You got cancer, get an abortion. Uh, you don't feel good, get an abortion. Uh, you're pregnant, you're in the military, get an abortion. It, it solves all the world's problems. Uh, Hurricane uh, uh, Katrina hits, get an abortion. Um, it's just constant. And this, you don't have to do this or we believe in you uh, is is true empowerment. And um, well, so that's why. That's why, Sean, the FDA is re is reducing all of the obstacles. You know, the one of the one of the keys in marketing and getting more of your product sold is to reduce the friction. And that's exactly what what the abortion industry is doing is they're they're trying to eliminate all the friction involves to rush that decision to to respond to that impulse by that they that they're counting on for their profits. And and what they what they discard with all of that is women's health. Uh, the care for women and the concern for uh, what the women are actually experiencing in favor of the product. Yeah, it sounds it's, like it's, a, it's, an increasing market then for those women who make the snap decision and are going to need to come come to heartbeat centers for abortion pill reversal. 
exactly. That we know that's that if there are going to be more abortions, more chemical abortions, then there certainly sh- should be more women that regret it and want to make that decision and change their minds. Uh, before we let you go, um, first off, I want to say again, thank you for for coming on and thank you for your work. Um, it's just I know we work together and yeah. we're in the grind and we see each other, but it just needs to be said. Just thank you. It's it's great work. I absolutely I admired Peggy it, uh, when she was president. Certainly have great respect and admiration for you and y'all's leadership. I think it's very important in the pro life movement that we we operate professionally and and uh, certainly Planned Parenthood uh, has tried to do that for decades and. And we need to beat their their standard for sure. Uh, and Heartbeat certainly does that. And um, I, I want to ask you as we close out, what post row, which we talk about a lot on here, I know we've seen the changes and things get bizarre and, and them attacking 40 Days for Life. We have a lawsuit right now against the DOJ on behalf of Mark Houck. Um, What do you, th- not necessarily politically, unless you want to get into that, I don't think you want to, but what do you? What's your prediction for 2024? What do you see playing out as far as the abortion landscape, how politics will or won't impact that with an election? And just, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Well, I'm I'm optimistic in the long run, uh, uh, but if you confine me to 2024, that means I'm not as optimistic in the short run, because I feel like collectively our, our culture is uh, of selfishness and individuality and demanding my own is having a temper tantrum. And so that's what we see it like that. We felt it here in Ohio, you know, with the vote that happened just in November, I think that that's happening. And I think that that's also what happened to our earlier conversation, what happened in the um, reconstruction environment, you know, where you had uh, the, the, the realities of, of racism that that was really a fabric of of slavery continue for decades after and so i don't know how long it's going to take us but that's the path that we have to travel and so i'm optimistic in the long run but we may go, you know have some hurdles in the short run to get over to really write the culture that we that that we know we need a culture of life, one that respects and values human life at all times. Because if, if we don't, the culture of death is going to take us even further down this tragic road and we have to do something and we need courageous politicians to step up and say, we have to do something different than we've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> you spoke for me for sure. And we've, we've, we've disclosed a lot of that on the podcast. So, uh, but very optimistic in the long run. And uh, thank you for your work. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Uh, how can people help uh, Heartbeat? You want to give a website? Yeah, well, heartbeatinternational.org. Uh, if you want to know more about us, we do all kinds of stuff around the U.S. and internationally. But the most important number to know, it really is optionline.org, the very number that you guys hold. I, I, Optionline really uh, is, if you want to call that and get, get connected to Heartbeat, that's fine. But really, that's for... Every person walking around, whether you know that are not on the sidewalk, but sitting in a pew or with neighbors or family members that are running into into a challenging pregnancy uh, dynamic that, that is being faced, optionline.org is the best thing. If there's a locator, you can find the pregnancy center near you, or just pass that number along: one eight hundred seven one two help. And we're there to help people c- get connected with life affirming care across the country and around the globe. It's great. It's great, and. Uh... We appreciate you coming on. And by the way, when you come to Houston, we are breaking your really horrible habit of not eating great food at these bars. <laughs> We're going to Minute Maid. We're going to watch the Astros, and you're going to have Takada Hernandez, and you're going to have brisket. Okay? It's going to uh, be bet. great. All you right. Bet. We, Looking we, forward we, to we, it. We will do that. Okay. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jarrell. Please rate, review, and share this podcast, and we will see you next time. God bless you. <laughs>